Hey everybody, Joy Brooks. Email and coffee with Joy Brooks and Joy Brooks. But this is not Joy Brooks. So I'm talking today with Matthew Vernhout. And uh, we're going to have uh, an interesting conversation about some technical aspects of email marketing. But in the meanwhile, Matt, go ahead, introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Matthew Vernhout. Uh, I am the Vice President of Deliverability for Europe, North and South America with Netcore Cloud. I'm also the individual behind Email Karma. So if you've uh, ever checked out my blog, uh, Email Karma is the name. It's also basically all of my social profiles, so I'm easy to find. Um, and I'm also the creative person behind the Canadian Email Summit. So that is something I've been running for uh, five years this year, and we're hoping to run it again uh, in the next couple of months. So if you're interested in, in participating in email in Canada, that's where I'm located. That's that's me in a nutshell. I've been doing this for uh, over 20 years now. Forever. <laughs> years for a long time. Yep. Um, and yeah, if you're if you're into some of the things we're going to talk about today, like AMP for email, uh, Netcore is about to release a, a AMP for email case study, um, or I guess not even case study. It's an information booklet. It's mm. uh, a hundred different case studies and 25 experts and amped for email mm -hmm. uh, are going to be included in this. So uh, check out the Netcore Cloud LinkedIn page to stay up to date for when we release that. Mm -hmm. And AMP by itself is a very interesting topic because, you know, I mean, when you really start talking about dynamic content and conditional and doing advanced personalization, personalization, um, we're generally talking about um, enterprise packages that can do this and or <laughs> AMP for email. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, th there are there are specific cases to use it. I, I don't think that it's for everybody. But at some point, it could be for everybody. Yeah, I agree. I think I think. AMP has some very powerful use cases. Should it be every campaign you send? No, but I would say the same thing for emojis. I would say the same thing for, you know, basically every other campaign that you're sending. It's mm -hmm. not an every campaign kind of thing, mm -hmm. but it's certainly a work it into your toolkit of campaign items. So there's some really solid use cases for it right now, I would say that yeah, I mean make it something. Once again, it, you know, it sort of goes back to strategy. And I sort of, when I had a conversation, when I have conversations about email, it's really like hitting strategy over the head constantly. And you need to strategize for AMP because you just don't say, oh, let's use AMP. Well, hello, you know, what are you going to use it for? Right. Um, and as I said, it has some, it has, it has a lot of interesting usages. Usually when people ask me, to explain AMP, I do the um, I do the uh, airline or you know I do the airline ex thing you know like oh, you, you've expressed interest in going to into Japan, and now for the rest of your life, <laughs> you're going to get emails about Japan, right? Because it knows when you left, you know what flight you took, what airport you flew into, and it's going to try to give you options on that forever. Um, and if you really don't use it properly, that's not the right way to use it because, you know, this person's not going to be just going to Japan forever. They're going to be going other places. And, um, you know, what it does is it provides you with follow up emails to that flight. Um, and the ability to say, let's track where these, you know, this person actually flew. So now this person is not only engaged with email, but is engaged with the brand. Let's track where they're going. What can we do for that type of person? There's some really solid use cases sort of, you know, in the airline industry. And there's some really cool demo stuff that we've we've put together. So, um, for example, you know, search flight directly from your email. So you could actually be in an AMP email and say, I am, you know, you know, my home city, my home airport. And I want to search flights for Japan. New York, Los Angeles, whatever it happens to be, and pull those results up directly in the email. So you don't even have to send somebody to another page. Mm -hmm. They can just do it directly in the email. 
You can also do things like, welcome back from your trip. Tell us where you'd like to go next time. So you could do that directly in the email. Um, and I think probably one of the coolest demos I've seen of the platform that we've done is choose your site or choose your seat, sorry, directly from the AMP email and then generate your seating QR code so you can board your flight. So you could get, here's your flight details, book your seat, it loads up an image that's live of the seating available on the plane. You pick your seats and then you get your tickets right through AMP. Right. And I mean, those are, those are, um, those are the advanced features of email that people, not all brands can, you know, not all brands have that, that interface that, or even require that interface or that complexity. They don't, it doesn't go that far. I mean, you buy a pair of shoes, you know, what size, obviously you've already picked the size. So, you know, it really needs a specific use case. And, but when you get to that level, that's the point. And that's where the strategy comes in. Yeah. And uh, um, for a brand, you know, for any brand, and you say to yourself, we'd really like to do something special. We'd really like to get uh, to be able to get more targeted in the email to the person what do we do and let's you know i'm going to say over and over again can we just not think about you know your first name that's not what we're talking about so if everybody could think about that then they would be creating use cases for amp but, but there's a lot of simple use cases right Go and ahead. i think people should should start with simple use cases so um you know I've talked about this to death over the years in regards to how many forms should you have on your consent form, right? The more fields you have on a consent form, the less likely someone is to fill it all out. So, you know, that magic number is like one to five. Mm -hmm. you know, email, first name, last name. Maybe you're asked gender. Maybe you ask birthday. City, something. They'll go, right? they'll go for birthday because they're figuring they're going to get some free yeah. stuff. Or birthday, right? So you're asking a, a very limited number of questions. But what AMP is great for is you could send a follow-up welcome email that says, hey, you didn't tell us what your birthday was when you filled out your form. Tell us now. And you can do it right in the email. Um, for businesses, you can do uh, book an appointment. Here's my calendar live through AMP. So someone could book an appointment. Um, download a white paper. And the form is in the email. And then the, the form to download the white paper is already in the person's inbox. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to go to another web page and ask for help uh, or ask for another email. Um, any type of preference management. You want to talk about shoe size. What is your shoe size? So the next time I send you an email, I send you the right size shoes only and what's in stock or um, clothing preferences, things like, do you have children? Yes or no, right? So you could use AMP for email to do live interactive polling of your audience at a very simple level that just integrates with your CDP mm -hmm. or your CRM solution, whichever, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you're looking at. So the use cases start from really simple in regards to just data collection, first party form data collection through way more complex to pick out your seat and get your download QR code. And, you know, maybe in the future, Right. I don't know if we're there yet, but maybe in the future it's check out and pay through email. Yeah. Right. Like that, that is not um, a, a, a use case that I foresee right now simply because uh, the security complexities behind it. Who's the payment processor? Where's the PCI compliance sit? Uh, and all of that. But could we be there in a couple of years? Sure. Moore's Law says we'll be there in a week. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, but the general idea being everybody can do simple AMP. You could use AMP to do your COI messaging. Click here to confirm you want to receive email from us. Click the email says, thank you for clicking. You don't have to send them to another web page. You don't have to send them anywhere. It's just, thanks for confirming you want to receive email. That's the most simple use case. Beyond that, the sky's the limit. Forms website registrations, webinar registrations, downloads. Right. Those are all very simple things. Um, 
and I think there's a there's a ton of use cases uh, for you know um, like a newspaper publisher as an example. Another use case could be your daily crossword comes to you through email and you can do it right in your inbox. Uh, Wordle was a big hit. You could do Wordle in your inbox. In your inbox, right? Um, and we've built even demos of like Bejeweled in your inbox. Send someone a daily Bejeweled oh. game. Move this stuff around. Gamification. And... Let me right? ask you a question though. Um, what inboxes are holding back? We know so, that Gmail isn't, or, or does Gmail not even? No. So you know, there's still only three providers really doing AMP. Uh, unfortunately, I'd love to see more. Uh, so you have Google is, is the biggest. Uh, Yahoo, which loves AMP, they have a, a huge roadmap of things that they want to build for AMP from preference management to tracking shipping and all of that directly in your email. And then mail.re. So those are the three. Um, and I think it's a, it's a bit of a chicken and egg, right? It's not enough brands are doing it that mailbox providers are really pushing to develop it because there's a lot of security implications that come with it and vice versa. There's not enough mailbox providers that support it. So brands are adverse to spending the money to adopt. So something comes to my, my mind when you said that Verizon, uh, that um, Yahoo is um, supporting it and that's Verizon. So they're Yahoo now. They're not Verizon anymore. What do you mean? Verizon Did, Ver, why Yahoo buy Verizon? <laughs> no, uh, Verizon or Yahoo. I, I thought Yahoo got sold. Again? Yeah, I don't think they're part of They manage Verizon's network, but I'm pretty sure they're not owned by Verizon anymore. I thought they were owned by the Yahoo and AOL were owned. They used to be. They used I don't believe to be? they are anymore. How? I mean, how 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 out of touch am I? Like a year or, or less? Uh, yeah, I would say a year or two. Oh, it's so totally out of let's google that so i'm totally gonna do it right now well while, while we're talking i'm gonna look it up but uh yeah i'm pretty sure that uh yahoo is uh independent again now okay because uh you know i could be i could be completely wrong but uh but, you know it, it's interesting because that would make that would make total sense the verizon would um I'm, I'm, have a yeah. hand under the under the slip of uh, Google. It would be interesting because that is quite a competition against Microsoft. Quite, quite a quite a bit of competition. Yeah. So September 2021, Yahoo and AOL were officially acquired and renamed Yahoo. Oh, really? So you're two so, years two years out of loop. So I'm two years out of the loop. I know why. I'm two years out of the loop, and um, Yahoo's Yahoo, huh? No wonder that. No wonder nothing's changed. They're owned by Apollo Group, and renamed Yahoo. I'm gonna look into that. Um, so, okay, so Gmail obviously is supporting it. Let's forget about my argument about Verizon, and um, Yahoo is behind it. So. And that still explains the, a relationship Yahoo wants to be in relationship with Google. And that makes you know, Yahoo is Yahoo is ab absolutely promoting and pushing uh, AMP more so, I think, than Gmail is. Gmail supports it, you know, even though they're one of the core originators behind the AMP idea. Um, Yahoo tends to focus on consumer experience. So they want to have an inbox that is completely consumer friendly. Um, and if that means interactive, engaging emails that have elements that, you know, keep a user um, in the inbox. Um, and that could be anything from like, yeah, like I said, tracking your shipping to um, exactly you light know. notifications and such in the inbox and all of that being driven, driven off AMP and schema. Um, yeah, that's they're going to drive that because it makes consumers happy. Yeah, we're going to talk about annotations and schema in a moment. But, um, okay, so um, we've, got, um, we've got a really great application that is ultra smart and can do a lot of interesting things and can provide a, a really solid experience for consumers. And then we've got privacy laws 
that um, <laughs> no third party cookies and, uh, you know, all of these things. And um, one definitely does not help the other. Um, one holds the other one back. And, you know, um, obviously, I don't want all my information in somebody else's hands. And I often say when people talk to me about what do I do for a living? Oh, you're marketing. Well, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know what? Um, when you're buying something, you want the best experience. Don't you want your, you know, don't you want Amazon to know what you've bought? Why wouldn't you? Well, have you ever talked, you know, right in front of your phone and then when you go on your computer, you're suddenly getting the advertisement? It's creepy. All right. You know, I, I'm not I'm not necessarily going to say your phone is listening or it's not, but it is. Um, but I am saying that there is a difference between going on Facebook and telling Facebook, I'm not at home. I'm at this restaurant and the babysitter is home with the kids and probably, you know, there's... <laughs> That is not the same thing as I wear a size seven shoe. Two different things. Sure. But it's and also who you're telling, right? So if you're out and you're shopping and you go to, you know, retailer.com and you want to buy some shoes, you're going to tell them the size shoe you need because obviously that's what you're buying. Um, you know, the privacy implications between the party you're interacting with retailer.com and yourself is a different relationship than if retailer.com sold your information to, you know, CIA. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not going to say that. If they want your information. I'm sure they've got it already. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, but I um, think that's, that, that's what people, that's, you know, these are the normal fears. Goes. These are the fears that people have. And when, you know, privacy laws are created and, and it's put up to a vote, these are the considerations that people do have. Absolutely. And I think, you know, like I said, like with AMP, it becomes a first party interaction or, or some people call it zero party. Exactly. I, 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 don't, I don't buy zero party. I, I think zero party is a is a made up term that is just another name for first party data. <laughs> um, you know, I think there's... Um, there's a difference between me voluntarily telling a brand information and that brand then reselling my personal information to a data aggregator or uh, another business that then uses that same personal information to either retarget or sell or share beyond the individual brand person relationship that I was managed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a, a clear, what I would say, you know, is normal expected relationship. And then this external third party relationship that most consumers don't think about. And that's the piece that really scares them mm -hmm. or makes them worry. And that's why when you look at a lot of these laws, it deals with, you know, what's your personal information, you know, defining it first off, second off, um, you know, the idea of opting out of sharing that information or having that information sold um, or knowing who that information was given to, right? Mm -hmm. That's the piece that consumers traditionally don't have. But as consumers become more privacy educated, mm -hmm. they want to know what's the workflow? Where does the data go? Mm -hmm. Who's using it? Who has access? Why does somebody have access to it? Um, and that's the piece that a lot of privacy legislation focuses on. It's not so much my relationship with a brand. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a piece that if there's a data breach, my relationship with the brand is damaged. Right. But if that brand then takes that data and gives it to a third party and that third party is breached, the chances of me as an individual knowing about it is reduced because now it's one step away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in case it, it, unless it hits the news or something like that. But then even then, you're not sure if your data is involved. Right. Right. So it's that what happens beyond the first party piece that most consumers that I talk to, most people I talk to, um, have concerns about. Yeah. Where does it go and what do they do with it when it gets there? Um, I think um, yet another um, something messy into the, um, the ingredients, um, AI that can scrape 
and can make a lot of connections. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think there's... and that's and that's that's more of a concern because the, they're they're already out. I mean, you could buy these things, bolt them into LinkedIn, and it does all of this great stuff that sends out all those annoying messages that you get. And um, you know, the thing is, if it's done well, if it's done again, if you have a strategy, and if it's done well it can be very successful. Now, I'm not saying AI is, is horror. It's just, if it's not done well, if it's just thrown together, it can be pretty scary. And um, I think that's what the issues should be. People should be aware that um, it's not just, um, they're just not, you know, don't, don't think that it's these huge privacy issues. It's somewhat um, technical along the lines of what is the company, you know, what is the company that just purchased your, your data doing with it? Um, are they selling it? Um, and uh, what other types of utilities are out there and how do they need to be governed so that they are not purchased innocently but can do all sorts of interesting things um and, yeah, and that, that's that's you know beyond data breach that's the concern i think people have is how are you profiling how are you using that information um and i think in most cases it's how is that information going to be used against me right as opposed to to benefit because a lot of um a lot of people have concerns about what is it going to be used to in my to my detriment mm -hmm. right um, people don't complain about things they like. People complain about things they don't like. Yeah. Um, and that's where or they I mean, just complain about the weather because they can. <laughs> that's true. It's too hot, right? <laughs> All winter, I hear it's too cold. Now it's too hot. Hot. Right? Exactly. <laughs> really? You never really peak. My favorite really times of the year. My favorite time of year is fall because it's not too hot. It's not, not too, too cold. cold. But they, they, it's like May thirty first. The heat, you know, the this, the temp, the, the temperature in the house is, is at seventy, and and June first, the air conditioning goes on. Can you right. please make up your mind? Because <laughs> yesterday we didn't need air conditioning, and today we do. Please. Right. In any case, no. It's um, it's uh, there. There's there's a um a very fine line drawn somewhere in the sand. And I don't think the consumer really understands it. Um, and it's holding back some fairly interesting tools. Um, and then it's moving other tools forward. So, you know, as I said, you're on your computer and you go to a website, a new one you haven't been to before, and you go to Facebook and the ad's going to pop up. If, if that, that brand has purchased no. ads, it's going to pop up. It's not creepy. It's business. So that amount, that information is being shared. Well, and, and historically, consumers have said they want relevant ads, but they want to do it in a way that's privacy friendly. And those two ideas don't always go hand in hand. I know right? you're shopping. Not... You're, you're shopping for guns. You go to Facebook. Your kids are around. Yeah. And suddenly the guns pop up and you're like, no, I don't think that's what I want. That's not a problem I have in Canada, but okay. <laughs> You know, it would be, you know, I mean, I'm not no, going to say I, porn because I doubt, although let me just tell you, there was a point, there was this window, a very odd window when Twitter was purchased that I was getting emails from Twitter with straight porn. And I was like, oh, th th this is not good. The algorithm changed. Well, a lot of people left too, right? So a lot of people left. So the data that was available changed and it might have been the same targeting but based on the I have no idea why other, you're sending me that yeah, I was the lack of other out. interaction 
I was creeped out and I was like, is this being done intentionally because is somebody trying to sabotage something? I just How deleted it. Because I didn't want to I didn't I didn't want to track me. Right. Yep. It's, you know, it's baiting you at that point. Go ahead, hit me, because that means that's what you want. Yeah, feeding the algorithm is 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 certainly something you have to be careful of too. Yes. Right? Um, you know, even like looking at things like TikTok. If you watch a video for more than say five seconds, it thinks I should serve more videos like this to you. That's right. Um, so you know, there are certain things that consumers have to take some responsibility to. That's right. right? That's so right. if you're concerned about things that you say or see, um, you know. It's, it's an old joke in the in the email field and probably others, but the idea is like never say anything on the internet you don't want read in court later. Mm -hmm. Right? So That's be right. cautious of what you say and how you say it and who you say it to. Be cautious of the things that you click on. Be cautious of the things that, um, you know, you don't want others to know right. in the future. Right. Um, and that's where, you know, that's where things like uh, privacy badges. So if you don't use Privacy Badger, you should look at it. So Privacy Badger is an in interesting tool. It's from the uh, EFF, which is the uh, Electronic Frontier Federation. So they're very pro-consumer privacy. Uh, they do a lot of great work in the background. Uh, but they have a, a, a plugin for your web browser that blocks tracking cookies and blocks third-party stuff that may do nefarious things. Uh, and not even nefarious, but like unexpected consumer things mm -hmm. um you know there's other plugins that you can get to block third-party facebook tracking to block tracking for other things you can go into all of your settings in almost every app and turn off the follow me around the internet option mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so consumers have tools that are you know in a perfect world would be on by default but are typically turned off by default. Um, so educating yourself and, and going in and, and learning a bit more uh, about your privacy options. I'm I'm 100% for that, right? Yeah. Um, you have to take some responsibility as a consumer to manage your data um, and be aware of who it's being given to and where it's going. Um, and then, you know, we'll get laws like PIPEDA here in Canada or the CCPA in California that come back and say, well, now you legally have the right to go to an organization and say, what do you know about me and what are you doing with my data? And if you don't like it, you can then go back to them and say, you can't sell it anymore or you have to delete it, right? So consumers have these rights now. And GDPR was a, is certainly a forerunner in a lot of that mm -hmm. because they've turn the tide from opt out to opt in, mm -hmm. in most cases, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not a hundred percent legitimate interest is still a thing, but um, you know, the idea of putting it back in the consumer's hand to say, well, now you need to stop because now I don't trust you anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's a moving bar of, I might trust you today. And then you have a data breach. Well, now I don't trust you anymore because now it's caused me financial loss or, embarrassment um you know because my credit card was compromised or you know i went to a website and there's a member at some website uh that i didn't want everyone to know about right like that's happened umpteen times probably one of the biggest ones that that we've seen in our generation was the ashley madison breach it exposed a lot of people that didn't want to be exposed in that um you know so that's where the intersection of data security, data privacy, client expectation, all sort of come together is you get this big data breach and all of those things are then violated and consumers are upset. And now they have to go through the management of managing personal relationships, managing financial relationships, managing credit reports, which then becomes consumer hassle, which then becomes complaints to legislators, which then becomes legislation. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, I, I, that's really why AMP is not everywhere at all times. No, and, and most recently there was an article that came out about how web AMP, not AMP for email, but web AMP, um, is being used to hide phishing, right? Um, so they're they're hiding phishing URLs behind the redirects of web pages oh. built by AMP. 
So, so you, you know, I mean, they're just, you, if you want to, you can figure anything out. Yeah. If you're going to um, hack, you can figure it out. You know, the, the gatekeepers with email make it significantly harder, mainly because not everybody's using AMP. Um, in order to send AMP to Yahoo or Google or mail.ru, you have to meet a minimum setup for your email, some DMARC compliance, DKIM, SPF, et cetera. They're going to, in Google's case, they review your email. They want to know that you're capable of sending quality AMP email. So they basically say, send us a test before we let you use it. Um, you know, so there's gates currently in the way, mm -hmm. right? For these things, much like Bimmy, there's gates in the way right now for that. So that's why not everyone's doing it. It's not okay. well, We'll talk also a little bit about Bimmy, like what um, it is and why people should do it. But yeah, that's a whole, that's a, a that's 30 a minute conversation in itself. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I agree. Like people, I just had a conversation with a client today about Bimmy and, you know, they came to me and they're like, well, you know, we have a lot of websites and I kind of quickly did the math in my head and I was like, that's a big investment for you to go out and do that for all of your brands uh, because you're looking at anywhere from you know a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per brand of a hundred brands that becomes very quickly uh, a big budget item for a brand mm -hmm. so you know, is it possible now uh you know it, it's a challenge uh but lots of brands are starting to do it right uh, i i'd like to you know explain Bimmy a little bit more because it's, you know, it's more than just my logo shows up in the email. It's the box. It's a little bit more than that. So, um, and you know, getting people, getting people to do SPF and DMARC yeah. is enough. Sometimes by that time they have, you know, only gray hair or no hair left in their heads. And, you know, you've had to literally get into their web, you know, go into their DNS to do it because they have no idea what the devil, please help me. I can't do this. Um, or, or the web administrator or their, you know, their, their administrator is like, why does your email person need to get into the DNS? <laughs> because we're talking about email. Why do they need to? Well, it's, it's kind of odd that they don't know this by now. Right. You think that at this point in time, the IT person would go, oh, we're doing email. Okay. They're going to need to get into DNS. They're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to adjust some text records. Okay. All right. It's okay. But yeah. it's it's always that conversation. Yeah, absolutely, and I think uh, and now Bimmy. <laughs> yeah, and and you know SPF is a challenge for brands, um, even though it's been around twenty years. It's a challenge for brands. I see SPF records all the time that are over ten lookups that are incorrect or using bad formatting, still using PTR records, even though those have been you know depreciated or recommended not to be used. For 10 years um you know i had a conversation with somebody the other day that's using spf plus all basically authorized the entire internet to send email on their behalf <laughs> and their response back was we can't do it any other way because our support our platforms don't support it <laughs> but uh, yeah like which I, I don't believe i think everyone should be able to do it you just need to know how to do it these are right. people that choose not to uh learn how to do it properly um, you know, again, like there's three basic authentication solutions I would say every brand should use for every domain they have SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. If you're doing those things properly, you shouldn't have any problem. You're protecting your brand, you're protecting your consumers, you're protecting your own network. Um, and sure, there's, there's nuances to all of them, but, um, that's why you work with your providers. That's why you work with um, you know, experts right. like, like, like us to say, you know, you need to do this for your SPF records. You need to do that for your DCAM record. Right. DMARC should and, look like and, this. And every providers, most providers will manage it differently. So the process is different. Sometimes they take control of it totally. Sometimes Absolutely. you need to do it. <clears throat> yeah. Like some providers will do NS delegation for a right. subdomain and they manage everything. Others will say, here's a couple C names, go and set those up. Others might say, you know, here's a bunch of A and tax records and MX records. But in the end, the way you manage it makes it that much better, right? right. Like 
you should never come back and say, well, I have to use the authorize the entire internet solution simply because you don't know how to do email. You're, if that's the case, your provider is doing you a disservice. Right. Right. And, and, you know, if you've got, you know, if you're hitting your head against the wall, trying to get into your DNS to update, or they're giving you the wrong information again, you know, they're doing you a disservice. If they're telling you, Oh no, it has to be this way. We have to let everybody in. It has to be, you know, yeah. this is the attribute. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know how many times it's happened to me as well. You know, you, whether you're, you know, you, there are so many people that are using GoDaddy, right? So that means you go into GoDaddy or you make the phone call. And it really depends on who you get on the phone when you make that support call. Yep. You can get somebody who knows everything is going to do it for you. Somebody who knows nothing and is going to tell you you can't do it because yep. they don't want to be bothered. So yep. I have, in my case, made like three phone calls. And I finally get the right support person and, and I'm like, thank God. And it's not, right. you know, it's, uh, it's life after COVID. Well, you know, again, like I said, the biggest challenges I see with, with SPF is people overstuff their records, put too many providers in. Right. They, um, they, you know, they use MailChimp 15 years ago and it's still there. Yeah. There's, there's absolutely rot. You know, there's a lot of rot. Um, there's, um, you know, and, and some providers are guilty of saying, well, I have to be in your corporate DNS record, which isn't true. You should be in a subdomain record assigned just to each vendor, um, which totally fixes this problem. But copy and paste is a huge issue as well. Someone will take a record, copy it out of an email, paste it into their DNS, and it doesn't format correctly. Or they just create a new record. Now, all of a sudden, you have two SPF records, and they're both wrong. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a minimum requirement of, of conversation or education that needs to happen, mm -hmm. um, to help people, but at some point collectively as a security driven industry, we need to sit down and think, you know, what is the minimum standard mm -hmm. and how do you get it right? And what's the long tail impact? Mm -hmm. There are financial institutions in the fortune 500 that can't figure out SPF. Then you have momandpop.com who don't even know what DNS is and they send all their email out of a Gmail account mm -hmm. or a Hotmail account to make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> Hotmail. An right? AOL account. Um, <laughs> I am, um, oh, I, I was going to say something about something. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Let's talk about Bimmy. Sure. So, so Bimmy, um, uh, brand identification, uh, brand indicators for message identification. Um, basically, like you said earlier, it is putting your logo in the mail client for email. Uh, it relies on strong authentication. So it relies on having your SPF record, your DKIM records and your DMARC records at enforcement. So it has to be at least a quarantine or a reject, uh, meaning you've done the homework to properly authenticate all your mail. Um, once you've accomplished that, you can then implement BIM. So you get uh, your logo, which uh, currently requires trademark. Uh, so that's another hurdle. And that's where like this becomes mm -hmm. that current stopgap for people, right? I don't, I don't own a trademark. Like I don't own a trademark on my logo. Mm -hmm. I don't own a trademark. I own a copyright. I've mm -hmm. used it for 16 years. I own a copyright, but I don't own a trademark. Um, so I can't get a Bimmy cert myself. Mind you, it's a thousand bucks a year and I'm not necessarily going to shell that out either at this point. If I was an independent consultant making a ton of money, then maybe sure. Um, but the idea being you're a brand, hopefully you own your trademark. You can then go out and get a verified mark certificate, uh, that says, yep, this is my logo. I own it. You build the DNS record and then, you know, Google, Yahoo, uh, Fastmail, a number of other providers as well, um, will start putting your logo in their mail clients and their mobile apps for their consumers to see. Um, it does require a certain level. Like I said, you, it's like a ride. You must be this tall to ride. Mm -hmm. And that's how it is. You must be this tall to ride. Um, 
the reward it's, for some brands is absolutely worth it. Then a thousand dollar investment to increase open rates by five to ten percent, click absolutely. rates by two or three percent is going to outweigh the thousand dollars a year cost mm -hmm. by far for a lot of brands. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really is like, you know, think about grade school. It's that gold star because you did a good thing this week at school. Right. right? That's well, it's, it you know, brand recognition right there. I mean, it's. Yeah. Most people recognize a picture before they recognize words. Right. right? And obviously, you know, that means that you've done work with your logo. So <laughs> when it's that small, it's still recognizable. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> And that, that's why it's built on an SVG graphic as well, right? right. So the idea is the, the vector graphic um, looks good at a teeny tiny size and looks good at super right. giant size um, because it scales nicely. And that's why when we were looking at the, the, the process, SVG was chosen. Um, they're relatively small as well. So they're, they're quick to, to deal with over the internet. Um, and... Uh, you know, we, we took a lot of the, the features out and actually created what's called Tiny Portable Secure uh, for SVG. Um, so it's a subset of the SVG class that has uh, security ideas built in, meaning, you know, no web beacons allowed, no animation allowed. So it's a bit more of a secure stripped down version of the SVG graphics uh, capability. Um, and I have to stop saying SVG graphics because it's... G in SVG is yes. the correct. <laughs> uh, the it's SVG a, image. It's a tiny shrimp. <laughs> that's right. Um, you know, I think that's the piece looking at it in regards to uh, you've done the homework, you did all the SPF, the DKIM, the DMARC stuff, and now you get to say, here's my logo as well. Mm -hmm. um, providers like Yahoo and Google when you do that, we'll actually put a little check mark that said, we verified this logo and sender are related. Who, who doesn't want a check mark? Who oh, doesn't want a check mark? Um, um, I, but, you know, in the back of my head, and I don't know why I'm thinking this, because I know that Gmail will send your, your personal picture. So if you've got a profile picture, it's going to send it. Do they do any logos on the fly? Because I'm thinking they do. So you could set your profile picture to be a logo. Um, and then when you send the email, that profile picture will be your logo. Right. Um, however, you know, will that support last forever? I can't say, right? Mm -hmm. Like Google might say it's BIMI or nothing. Um, you know, they used to use social profile. They used to use like, so if they could tie your Twitter account to your domain name, they would use that. Um, Yahoo did the same. Um, you know, Gravatar was a thing for a long time. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, as we move to more secure and more quick to verify ownership and logo management of things, I think you'll see these platforms gravitate towards the more secure option, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to one that anyone could, uh, implement. Mm -hmm. um, and even now you're starting to see it. So if a brand shows up. Uh, you know, if I were to send you an email from my work email, mm -hmm. the BIMI graphic would show up as Netcore. Mm -hmm. And then if you hovered over my name, the profile card that shows up would be my image with my information. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have the ability to have both the brand logo and the user profile show up uh, with different images. And that's pretty important for B2B. Sure. Yeah. Pretty important for B2B. I just, you know, I, I'm not going to say it's an argument, but uh, I adhere to the fact that people don't read the subject lines. It's really brand recognition. So it's that from address. And um, if they're not rushing through their emails and they're looking for something specific, then they're going to start to read the subject line. But mm -hmm. if they're, you know, if it's, and this is the difference between B2B and direct to consumer. The consumer may not be looking at it at all. They're just waiting for that email to come in because they want to shop. And they don't care what it's about. They're looking for the coupon or whatever, and they're shopping. So go ahead with the, you know, you can go into A-B testing until the cows come home. It, it's 
the results are dark. You don't know that if that, it's just that it's time for this person to shop. That's it. You know, it's summertime and they want, they want swimsuits and sneakers, right? It's just, it just, it's just that. It has nothing to do with anything else. But for, for B2B, it's, it's so much more complex. It really is because, um, yes, when a company finds it time to connect with a vendor or a client, which are, you know, whatever the relationship is, there, they may be searching for email. So the subject line is important, but the initial sub, you know, you get the email in, I don't think they're necessarily looking at the subject line. I don't think so. You know, I scan subject lines, but again, like being an email geek and being in the industry, like, I'm not, you know, I know what I subscribe to. I know what I don't subscribe to. Um, I scan subject lines for me because I get so much email. Mm -hmm. Subject line at least gives me some insight as to what's inside, whether I'm yes. going to open it or yes. not. So for yes. me, it absolutely makes a difference what the subject right. line is. And that's, um, that's the B2B mentality. It's like you're getting a lot of mail and you are looking for some messages. So you're going to scan them, right? Yeah. That's the B2B yeah. mentality. And, yeah. and get... really that is, it's not, it might not be so much. Well, you know, I, I, I'm mm. discussing it ad nauseum, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, get a few thousand, I get a few thousand commercial email a month. So, you know, for me, I need to be scanning subject lines or else I'm never going to engage. Or I just use the search function in, in my email. Right. That's, that's what I um, said. That, is, that is the mechanism. That is the mechanism. That's when the subject line comes in handy. And that's what people really should be thinking about when they build a subject line. Is it searchable? And does it, you know, is, is that the content that they're going to find? Because you're not doing them a service at all. If it, you know, your email is this, you know, this catchy, you know, groovy thing going on there, which, you know, everyone can laugh about, but doesn't <laughs> provide them with anything in the guts. Right. And, you know, the other thing that I say all the time <laughs> is that the only people that are looking at the layout of an email, you know, the complexity of the layout of the email are marketing people that the consumer has no clue what the heck you're talking about. If they get an email that they can read, that's all they care. I mean, that they could see, that they could read. The images are nice and crisp and clean. There's yeah. no mistakes. That's all they they care about. They are not running around the house showing everybody, look at this email. I want to do this email. How did they do this email? Oh, my God. This e Nobody's doing that. On the phone. Oh, my wow. God. I just got this email. Nobody's this doing that. We my do wife, that. We do my that. Wife, my wife will be like, look at this email. Well, of course. Either because it was good or because it was awful. Sometimes it's, oh my God, look how broken this was. Right. But other times it's, it's uh, you know, she'll but send she me something. But she knows because of the business you're in. Right. So it, I, again, like I said, I'm not the ideal audience for that. Yeah. But um, I also understand that. And yeah, absolutely. Like we, as an organization, even here in NetCore, we look at what other people are doing because it inspires us to go back to our customers and say, you could be doing this too. Uh, so yeah, I'm not the target audience for most of these things. Uh, I'm a passive subscriber in a lot of cases. And uh, when I want to read your email, I go and I find it and I read it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I had a, um, a situation with a client that their images... Um, they weren't that old, but they had people with masks on mm -hmm. and they were, they wanted to send them out this year. And I was like, <sighs> I'm like, it's, I understand where these pictures are coming from and that this, that, and the other thing. I said, but you're reminding your consumers of something that they might not want to see. Yeah. And that's where personalization comes in too. Cause like I've seen really cool personalizations from like car companies where they'll send you you know, your car is due for service and they actually put a photo of your car in the email because they know the car you have, right. or at least the car you had the last time you saw with them. Right. Right. So the, they would put it in, make model color, everything right. and be like, your car is due for an oil change. Right. And you instantly relate to that because you instantly relate to the image of your own car or the model of your car. Uh, you could do the same with, if you knew someone's ethnicity, you could change all the images of people to be a matching ethnicity. Right. Um, if you want. 
Um, there are lots of much, cool things that can be done that yeah. that are you know that that are, that that help and you know that are relatable that are targeting that are focused that are doing all these really cool things and that aren't creepy that's the one piece i would always say so when about they get wrong, they're creepy. is don't be overly creepy yeah when they, when when it's wrong it's creepy because you're like mm, no well, it's you on the nose it's creepy there's difference right yeah, if, that's, there's, if it's wrong it's creepy but if well, it's too on the nose, it's yeah. also creepy. If you get something in the mail that um, says, you know, your car is ready for an oil change and it's you sitting in the car, that's too creepy. I, I mean, I did buy a car. The first car that I bought, they sent me home with a calendar and my photo was on the calendar for a point. <laughs> um, you know, or they mailed it to me, I think, because they took a photo when I bought the car and then a few days, like a, a month later or something, a calendar showed up with my photo so they custom printed a calendar okay which was fun right but like who wants a photo of themselves for a year hanging hanging yeah. <laughs> in, their, yeah. in their office or wherever you know marketing was good but uh, you know uh, maybe just on the keychain <laughs> maybe you know maybe yeah. So um, I saw something the other day coming through um, uh, Twilio. So um, uh, there have been some things going on with SMS and, you know, with telephone numbers and uh, um, and I saw something come through with um, data transfer. So any data coming from Europe, X, Y, and Z, right? Okay. So can we talk a little bit about that though? The issues of data exchange and for people that are, you know, so if you're just doing work, you know, if you're just, just doing, um, if you're just communicating with people with contacts in the U S obviously you, all you have to deal, deal with is either Canada or California. But if you've got an international business, you have some concerns that data has a lot of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think there's, I think there's 15 States now that have passed privacy legislation similar to CCPA or, or some variation of that. So it's coming, right. It's, kind of it's still a big patchwork. And, and I think there's another 10 or 15 States actively working on legislation. Um, you know, the biggest change that we've seen is um, what used to be known as safe Harbor is now, uh, I forget what they're calling it now, but anyway, Safe Harbor was sort of taken down by the EU courts. There was a court count challenge against data adequacy and data transfers under GDPR into the United States. And so that got sort of wiped out. And then a second attempt was made. And again, that kind of got wiped out through the court systems in the EU, basically saying not enough adequacy, not enough... Um, regulation to really protect consumer data of EU citizens in the US. Uh, most recently, there was an agreement between the US government and the EU government body uh, around data transfers. So I think what you're seeing with that announcement, I haven't seen the announcement. Um, I think what you're seeing is the reaction to the new Intergovernment relations. Something that called DTF. Yeah, I don't remember what I don't. I don't know what it. Yeah. I, I guess I haven't seen the announcement from from Twilio, so I can't uh, can't comment on it. But I think what you're seeing is businesses are now saying, okay, so I have a legal way to transfer data between the EU and North America now, or the U.S. specifically. Uh, and so what you're seeing is their response to that. But I haven't mm -hmm. seen it, so I can't really comment on what their response is. <laughs> When, when um, a situation um, like that gets acknowledged and, you know, you tell a cuss, if you're an email, you tell a, a client, you know, your legal department just needs to align. Like, it has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. It's your company, your, your legal department needs to know this exists and just align. And they're like, oh, I, I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> and, you know, you're just like, ah. Oh. And you don't want them to stop doing email. Yeah. Right. But there are some, it isn't, a, it's not a game over 
situation. And it's not like um, every single email is going to cause an issue. But when that issue happens, it can it can destroy smaller companies. Sure. Yeah. Well, what we've done to manage that is we set up a data center in Europe, so we don't have to worry about transferring data outside of Europe. Right. Um, we have a team that manages it. that's local. We have a you know separate data infrastructure. It's all managed within the EU, so it's all subject to the EU law and EU data transfer. <laughs> Um, it does avoid the idea of having to, not completely, but clearly we still have to sign the, the, the respective contracts mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Such about being data stewards and, and data processors. Um, but it does avoid a lot of the, this data will be transferred to the, you know, outside the EU. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but like you're saying, not everyone's capable of doing that. There's a lot of providers already within the EU as well that don't run into that issue. Um, So yeah, it it does create a bit of a privacy bubble. Mm -hmm. When companies are are really concerned about it, it can can become this big deal. And there are, I mean, there are some industries, (laughs) healthcare, that um, are, you know, pretty concerned about their data. And that's not, I mean, that that is a game changer for them. So they're going to, make sure everything's in place before that happens. And sometimes the um, provider can be in, can be in Europe. So if you're going to be dealing with, um, you know, uh, dot digital, if you're going to be dealing with is active campaign in Australia or is it no Marigold. So if you're going to be dealing with um, um, campaign monitor, Right. You have to realize that everything, every your data may just be in the United States, but it's not it's not stored in the United States right. or it might be. But it's getting exchanged through a company that has um, other, um, um, you know, it, it stores data in other companies. And yeah. those I mean, these are the things that never, you know, I mean, a lot of com- a lot of people don't even realize that, oh, EU, it's not my problem. Mm. <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing, right? Because a lot of people think EU is not my problem, but the law actually focuses around the user's residence. So if there is an EU resident visiting the US and you're manipulating their data, mm-hmm. GDPR technically still applies because they're a European resident. Mm-hmm. Right, in theory. Whether you can enforce it or not, that's, you know, completely right. It's hard to enforce laws outside your own borders as a country, mm-hmm. but, you know, it's uh, not to say it doesn't happen, but it's a much more complicated process. Yeah. Probably one of the one of the ones that sticks out for me the most was the uh, Canadian government, the CRTC, uh, issued a notice of violation to Ancestry Ireland for uh, under the anti-spam legislation. But because they're based in Ireland, it's much harder to actually enforce it. Uh, so it's not a monetary penalty, but it's a, I'm going to embarrass you publicly by saying you violated the law. <laughs> right. 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 Um, so, you know, there's, there's public embarrassment and then there's enforcement, which is much harder to do outside of your, um, your boundaries. Have, have you, are you aware of any, any, any um, cases where companies have, really broken um so so all the cases that have been through um for the most part within the canadian anti-spam legislation have been valid under some form of a violation Mm -hmm. whether it was intentional violation um like egregiously going out of their way to knowingly violate or not um you know one was uh there was an unsubscribe it was fully functional but instead of being a one click, two click, unsubscribe. It was eight pages of data you had to provide to unsubscribe, which is a violate. You could do it, but it's a violation, right? Another was- Why would you do that? Like, just please get them off your list. Well, I'm sure you've talked to to brands before that the idea is, how many consumers can I keep by making it frustrating, right? Right? Consumers use the report spam button when that kind of thing happens. Yeah. Um, You know, there was another case that was a very small sender 
uh, you know, a private business owner doing it on his own, sending it from his home business in violation of the law. And they said, yeah, you violated the law. You sent unsolicited emails to people. And he got a very small fine because the fines are propor proportionate to the violation, right? Mm -hmm. Sending 15,000 emails in violation is a lot different than sending 150 million emails in violation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there have been fines for um, sending after unsubscribing, which doesn't always mean you did it on purpose. It could be you had a data flaw. You could have had a bad CRM. You could have lost data in transit. Who knows? The preference right? center is working, but it's not hooked up to anything. It's working, but not working. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think any of the cases that have actually resulted in fines have been for anyone doing anything super egregious um, or malicious. Um, they've been people that generally want to do the right thing, but haven't done it the right way. Well, the and right that's why we haven't seen, make money. <laughs> that's why we haven't seen a, a $10 million fine from mm -hmm. the CRTC for casting, mm -hmm. right? It's been hundred thousand here, hundred thousand there sort of thing. So it's, right. Big businesses getting small penalties to basically put them on notice that says, you know, this could have been a lot bigger, but you worked with us and you fixed it. Mm -hmm. so why would it penalize you further? If you do it again, it's a different conversation, right? Yeah. Shame on you, shame on me sort of conversation. Yeah. And um, to some extent, your ESP, the, your provider, or your EMP, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, I mean, they may shut you down and it may be frustrating for you. And um, you may say email marketing uh, sucks, you know. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. It's just the provider protecting everyone else. And then sometimes you, the, the same breath you know, the, the provider is allowing somebody else to send out spam. And, you know, you're wondering, they shut me down and I'm actually doing the right thing. I made a mistake. And this one's still going, you know, and it's selling their cousin. Uh, and I don't understand how's that, you know, how can that be? Um, and, you know, you, I get spam all the time. Um, and I'm amazed. You know, I'm amazed. Yeah. And, um, I've had customers get shut down and I explain it to them and, and they're just angry. Sometimes, you know, having over the years had to shut down customers for various things. Um, you know, not all of them malicious, but a lot of times it's how willing is the customer to work with the organization to resolve whatever the problem is. Mm -hmm. Customers that, say, sure, help me fix this, get a lot more rope mm -hmm. than customers that are like, I don't care what you say, let me do it anyways. Mm -hmm. Those customers tend to get very short ropes and get mm -hmm. cancellation notices very quick. Mm -hmm. Customers that say, um, you know, whatever I need to do, what changes do I need to make? How do I go about doing this? I didn't know, thanks for telling me and actually make progress and make changes. I'm willing to work with those customers hours and hours on end to upgrade their programs uh, and keep them as customers. Because it's expensive for me to get new customers and onboard customers. Right, exactly. Right? A customer that's willing to work with me and fix their problems, whether it's a spam house listing, whether it's a, you know, um, junk mail delivery, whatever it happens to be, I'm way more willing to work with a customer that says, help me, teach me, educate me so I can be better than a customer that says, leave me alone. I know, I know what I'm doing. doing. My cousin's <laughs> brother does it so I can do it too. <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah. And like, you know, I've, I've fired very large brands as customers before. Um, and it cost them millions of dollars because they failed to make the simple changes that we required in order for them to not be in breach of our contract. Yeah. And it wasn't even a hard decision in the end. It was this contract you signed right here, you're in violation of it. So therefore I'm canceling it. Right. 
uh, I have a legal recourse to do that. It's my network. I can send what I want. Um, you know, and it, it impacts their business. Um, but I've also worked with very large senders that have big giant programs where left hand doesn't know what right hand's doing to get them all in a room and educate them all and make an internal process for them and figure it out and allow them to carry on and become better senders as an organization. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes difficult and it's usually the, uh, um, the entrepreneur, solopreneur with the, um, with, with the homegrown list, not just so much the purchase list. That's a, that, and that is yet another conversation. But, you know, where they, you know, they feel that their list is pristine and it's, and you just can't get into, get into their head that, you know, cold emailing is different. Um, it's a process. You just don't blast to everybody. Yes, it, you know, takes months off of the sales cycle if done correctly <laughs> with strategy and content. You know, they just seem to think. And, you know, be that as it may, email is the miracle channel. It is. But that doesn't mean it's a miracle in itself. It's, it's not the well, miracle by itself. No. There, there's cultural differences too, right? What North Americans accept for behavior versus what right. people in India accept for behavior as consumers from brands versus right. what people in China maybe accept uh, or Africa, right? is very different. So the response needs to be appropriate to what your network rules are, but also, you know, maybe it's perfectly legal to send spam somewhere. And so every brand on the planet that sends there does it, mm -hmm. right? And you can't fault somebody for basically saying, you know, this is how business is done in my country. Right. Right. And your answer becomes great. That's not how business is done on my network. So right. let's figure that out because that becomes a different discussion than I know you're buying lists and just blasting the people over and over again. That's not allowed. Your business has to change or you have to go elsewhere. They're two very different discussions. I still find it difficult having that list conversation. So, well, they're still in business, so they must be good. Well, yeah, but spam spam itself is a numbers game, right? Um, like if you if you even look at things like the the ninety nine percent effective rule, right? So you take ten million spam messages, of which ninety nine percent are blocked, right? So you have a uh, hundred thousand spam messages that didn't get blocked on on that, right? Or a million spam messages that didn't get blocked, right? Those then make it through the first layer of filtering, of which. You know, if we say 99% of those get filtered to the junk folder, right? Now you're at like 100,000 messages that made it to the inbox. And if 99% of those are ignored, well, now you're at like 10,000 messages that get opened and clicked, mm -hmm. right? It's an economics game that way. Yeah, but even it's if lazy, you're 99% effective. It's such lazy marketing. Yeah, but even if you're 99% effective at filtering out the garbage, that 1% or 0.1%, Right, because there's hundreds of billions of spam messages sent on the planet every day, mm -hmm. of which never even make it out of the network mm -hmm. to get to the intended destination. But we're talking such big volumes that 0.01% is still a lot. And, you know, and and those <laughs> I hate to say, and those spam messages tend to be the phishing messages, which actually make it eventually. It's like, but these people are playing a different game. They're just uh, uh, forcing mail through an SMTP. Well, like, they're, let's they're hack this to death until they shut it down. We've got a They're doing a hundred variations. Yeah, they're doing a hundred AB splits to figure out which of the AB splits fits. And normal marketers are doing one, maybe two versions. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting industry. <laughs> and and like, like you said, the hardcore evil senders are just pushing billions of messages and hoping for that 0.1%. Right. And when they get granny to click on it and, you know, to give the information. 
clean out her bank account. And... They clean out her bank account. And that's the news that we hear. Yep. And they were like, oh, email's so evil. Yep. <laughs> but like, if you talk to mailbox providers and they'll say, if they have 10 things to do today, dealing with an ESP is number 11 on their list because those 10 other things are priority because they're, they're phishing and malware and compromised accounts and account takeover and, you know, all these other things that are way worse than did your message get delivered, but to the junk folder it did. So the consumer has the ability to say it's not junk. Okay. We'll get to you when I have a minute. <laughs> yeah. We'll get you in a hot minute. <laughs> right. Now every mailbox provided differently, but you know, yeah. the general idea is, you know, if there's, if 10 things on the list to do today, you're probably number 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, uh, the, uh, the weeds of email. So the big question is, I love to ask this question. Will email ever die? And that's the last question of the day. Will email ever die? Like I can't, I can't not say ever. Is it going to die anytime near in the near future? No. Yeah. Right. Social networks are never going to be the way that people are going to transfer large data files. They're never going to be the way that people are communicating with history. And, uh, email makes a great archive for what did we talk about? Mm -hmm. S you know, Slack and Mastodon and Blue Sky never have that longevity of history in a conversation that email will have. Mm -hmm. Right. If we can, if we can see anything about social networks, they come and go. Right. They evolve. They change. Um, people migrate between them. You know, even people migrate their email address. But in almost every platform that you integrate with, or as an individual interact with, it requires an email mm -hmm. to get on the platform. Mm -hmm. um, you know, will it die? I, I can't say it will or won't. Will it die anytime soon? Definitely not. Will it continue to evolve? Like is is AMP the end state? I don't think so, right? AMP is the next step. What's beyond AMP? Who knows, right? But I think we need to get to a point where, you know, 20 years ago, we were sending multi-part emails that were text. Do you remember rich text AOL? mime type just so you could get AOL delivered and then HTML. So you had three mime types you were sending for email. Well, now we're down to two. Well, now we're back to three because we're getting into AMP. Well, hopefully at some point we can say HTML type doesn't exist anymore. We're going to send text and AMP only. Mm. And then maybe we get to a point where it's text and AMP and whatever the next iteration mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. AMP 2.0, AMP 4.0 or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, will it go away? Uh, maybe. Is it going to go away in the next 10 years? Mm -mm. No. Email growth rate is, is still phenomenal. It's still astronomical. It's still on the upward hockey stick. Um, mm -hmm. It's not going anywhere. It's it's sticking around. It's going to be you know, around a lot longer than some of these other social platforms, I think. I mean, um, postal mail is was over 100 years old, so hello. That's, that's uh, I still get postal mail. <laughs> you know, d direct mail has is still direct mail is having a revival. Right, because nobody does it anymore. So all of a sudden, you get something in your letterbox, and you're like, "Oh my God, somebody right. sent me a flyer!" Right? right? Or but, um, you know, in my but, case, it's somebody wants to sell my house every week. I'm not yeah. planning on moving. But you know, somewhat like the uh, the check that you, you know, the, che the checkbook that you have in the closet when somebody says, you know, uh, can you send me, you know, 50 bucks? And you're like, okay, sure. What's just, you know, what's a Zelle? What's, what's Venmo? Whatever. And they're like, can you send me a check? And you're like, what? Yeah, I don't, I, I'd have to dig for an hour to find my checkbook. Right. Well, <laughs> so I don't think that will happen to either mail or email. Right. I think they'll be around. There's always going to be a use case for them. Um, you know, will it be the volumes that we have now? But if, if anything's changing, like volumes are still growing, businesses are sending more email than ever. It will change. Well, you know what? I will say this. The, um, the, the youth of today, um, once they become consumers, 
they will change it, how they consume. Um, and if they consume the same way, then it's valid. But if the way they consume is generally through apps or whatever it is, then, you know, that really does uh, put a, you know, force email to pivot in some way. So, you know, mobile apps and things of that nature where people can just buy it on the phone, yep. don't need an email, get a push you know, get push notification. Yep. Um, that is, um, yeah, that that's competition, but it's not, it's not going to replace. It really is the, you know, it will be the way the consumer manage, the way the consumer forces the industry. Well, and, and it, like I said earlier, geographic makes a big deal in regards to how you interact, right? Mm -hmm. SMS, SMS and WhatsApp is a very large communication solution in our India audience mm -hmm. for our brands um, interacting with their consumers. Mm -hmm. In North America, you probably couldn't name four brands that use WhatsApp to communicate with customers. Right, right, exactly. Um, in Europe, Right. Yeah. I've dealt with customer service over WhatsApp, mm -hmm. um, but not Mark. Mm -hmm. you know, SMS marketing happens here a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in other regions, if you're not doing SMS marketing, you're not Mark. Right. So, you know, consumer expectations will change. Will it ever replace email? I don't think so, because what else can you say in 255 characters or 500 characters? Yes. That, you know, email allows you to have as many characters virtually yeah. as you want. Right, exactly. I mean, look at Twitter. Twitter was like, you know, two. You uh, how many characters was it in the beginning? And you're like uh, one fifty five. Yeah, or something. and it was, if you know, if they had, if they had stayed that, they would have never made. Yeah, right. What the, you know made the inroads that they did. So right. you know, email has has firm roots. Um. But there'll be there'll be a, a point where it will need to pivot, and at that point, just like just like uh, snail mail, it needed to pivot. It's still available. You still have a post office, and the post office said, "Oh, uh, what else?" You know, in the U.S., said, "What else are we going to do?" So they made deals. They made deals with Amazon. They made deals with FedEx and UPS. They made deals. So that's what email would be doing: would be making some sort of a deal to stay valid. And if it doesn't, it's not a good business, period. And that's not the case. Yeah. It's not the and that, case. Like I said, that's where I think AMP is the next step for email. Yes. It will become much more engaging, much more consumer friendly, much more consumer focused. Um, but, you know, too much B2B communication is done over email. It's never going to get replaced, at least not yeah. in the foreseeable future. Right, right, right. So uh, do you have any last words? You know, I think uh, authenticate your email. That's one. Make sure you get it right. Find a consultant if you need help. Talk to your ESP. Uh, they will help you out typically. If not, they know a consultant that can help. Um, check out AMP for email if you're really interested. Um, you know, netcorecloud.com. We've got a ton of content on AMP. Um, for your email, I think there's some really interesting things. Watch out for our our AMP um, our AMP guide that will be coming out shortly. Um, depending on when you post this, it might be out already. <laughs> is, it, is it a PDF or is it a book or what is it? Uh, yeah, it'll be a it'll be a PDF. Okay. Um, that'll be available on our website. Uh, I, I think I'm I'm trying to recall off the top of my head. I think at the end of August. Okay. So, um, and that, the, the website is netcore.com? Netcorecloud. Netcore Cloud. Uh, but yeah, find us on LinkedIn. Um, and if you care about email marketing and, and want to, um, you know, follow along, I'm, I'm basically email karma everywhere. Um, For a long time. You know, I'm around. So find me on all the socials. Um, and uh, yeah, I love talking email. It's, uh, it's what I do. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me. Great chatting okay. with you again. Okay. It's been far too long. I know, right? I'll have to I'll have to crash the next uh, Toronto networking group. There you go. Maybe Absolutely. in person. <laughs>
<laughs> we're gonna we're gonna try to do one. Well, the last time we tried to set one up, it failed miserably because everyone got busy. But we'll try again. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> you know, if it's virtual, I'm there. I'm all in. All right. I'll buy Sounds the good. coffee. I'll buy the virtual coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. Take care, everybody. Right. Thanks very much. Cheers. All right. Bye.